Let's Talk Supply Chain. So welcome to the show, DC, Hope, Eric, and Judd. I'm super excited to have you all here in one place to celebrate Halloween and our 300th episode. And of course, today we're talking about supply chain horror stories. So I hope you've all come armed with your most horrifying tales. Now, Rob and Audrey are supposed to be here with us as well. This is a very casual episode. So if they show up, they show up. If they do not, then that's fine too. But let's get started. Judd, why don't you tell us who you are, what you do, and what show you host? All right, great. Thanks for having me. My name is Judd Marcello. I'm the chief marketing officer for a company called Farai. Farai is a uh, delivery logistics platform or a SaaS company. And the show we host is called Special Delivery with Farai. I love it. Hope, you're up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Hope White, uh, CEO of HD Dredge and Container Services. Uh, we are a dredge, full-on dredge provider out of the Savannah, Charleston market. So we have trucking services as well as container storage services with about 10 and a half acres of land. Um, and I also host a show called No Bullshipping with Hope White. Love it. Love it. DC, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, my name is DC Spregola. I am the CEO and founder of NewGen Architects. Um, we are solution architects and business architects. We support software vendors and customers on their supply chain, cloud-based technology implementation, digital transformation journeys. So I host a show called Action Items with Let's Talk Supply Chain. Yes, and we always get our monthly action items for you. We come out with like checklists, I think, after every single one of your shows. I love it. That, that, is, that is the point. <laughs> <laughs> that is the point. All right, Eric, last but not least. Everyone, Eric Johnson. Uh, I'm a senior technology editor at the Journal of Commerce and JOC.com. Uh, and in my spare time, I host a twice uh, monthly show on the Let's Talk Supply Chain Network called Log Tech Live. Definitely the worst name out of the four shows here. I'm super jealous, Hope. I feel like I'm going to steal that from you. Uh, but super happy to be here. It's great great to be with everyone. You, you should have been on the meeting when, when we were coming up with the name for Hope's show. We went through everything, and then I think I shouted out, no bullshitting, and Hope's like, that's, that's it. Me, baby. That's the one. That is me. I'm just going to show up on your show one time and be like, this is my show now. Sure. You should just take no bullshitting. Just steal it. Just absolutely take it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you can see, we have a ton of personalities on this episode. So we will try to keep it as long as we want to keep it because let's just face it, everybody wants to hear from us anyway. So let's get started with our personal experiences um, that we've collected from our various roles over the years because we've all been in supply chain for a long time. And I'm sure between all of us, we have a lot to say. So I'll do my best to keep the episode on time. But who wants to go first? Who has a supply chain horror story that they would like to share with the audience? Nobody? <laughs> Did nobody That's a scary moment. This episode? <laughs> well, well I, I think so. So to be fair, I can only see you, Sarah, and I like can't figure out how to do the gallery view. So I don't oh. want to like talk over <laughs> okay so dc i think you're on your phone so swipe right and you'll be able to see all of us i think on your phone right i i, I feel technology I, I, i'm sad that we're recording this I technology from, from the person that supports digital implementation of the technology <laughs> And I didn't know how to do gallery view on my phone with Zoom. Like, so this is the first horror story of the episode. This is it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you have any horror stories you want to share with us? I know you do. Oh, God. On my show or just in supply chain in general? Just in supply chain in general. Through your years in supply chain, has there been yeah. any horror stories? Yeah, I think not getting paid for about eight months is probably the biggest horror story of, lo of them all. <laughs> especially for a small business especially for a small business like we are just and this is current this is real life this is a true story uh we're currently behind our receivables with a lovely client to the to a large tune and we're about eight months behind their oldest invoice is january wow um, and we're still still having to resubmit and it's being pushed off to different facets of their payroll and Counting supply chain. Um, and so we're just in a constant rebuttal. Well, and I think this is a good story because at the end of the day, supply chain is touched by every single department in a business. Yeah. 
And this just goes to show that from a finance perspective, either as an entrepreneur having cash flow horror stories, yeah, right? Or whether it's something on the road or on the water or anything like that, so many things can happen in the life of a product in supply chain. And this is just one of them, whether it's a product or an entrepreneur, you know, somebody who's who's got their own business. Yeah, it's definitely a nightmare for us. Um, we, we're trying paid. to wake up every day. <laughs> yeah. this, is a, this is an example of where it's okay to fire your customer too, right? So yeah, yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. Uh, we're kind of in a pickle with that piece of it because we have to think of our other c- contractors and employees um, that we have on hand for this particular client. So it's not going to be as cut and dry until we can replace those receivables coming in. Um, but it's definitely a nightmare. Definitely. Well, thank well, you. I mean, it also goes to just talk about, and we've been talking about it so much since, you know, the pandemic started years ago of being, you know, supplier relationships mm-hmm. and everyone looking out for each other and understanding Absolutely. that you provide a service for me, but I also, like, you have to pay people. There yes. are people who depend on you. And you can't provide a service for me if I don't pay you because you can't pay them. So it, it becomes a conversation of like everyone just be a good person. <laughs> like, you know, try <laughs> best to just be a good person, to be a good customer, to be a good supplier, to be a good partner, and to have those conversations. I mean, I, I sat down with one of our um, subcontractors yesterday, and, you know, like we had a very serious conversation. We have some they've been depending on some uh, big receivables from us for the last year or so. And he's like, Hey, going forward, what are we planning for? And I'm like, dude, I don't know, but let's figure it out (laughs) together. Like the customer cannot get it together, Yeah, but but I get it. You have to pay people. I have to pay you have to have this conversation together and figure it out because then it becomes, how do we work together to maintain cash Mm. flow? Because now they're at the risk of, you don't want to work with them anymore. Yeah, and, it's, yeah. You know. it's definitely spiraled to, uh, I can, I say it as a, a bad boyfriend relationship or a bad breakup at this point. I don't really want to hear anything else you have to say. <laughs> the stuff that you owe me and move on. <laughs> Isn't it, it's interesting though, like how you would never do this, this type of thing in your personal life, no. but things no. like this are so commonplace in B2B situations where, there's actually like I don't have a contract. I had a guy this summer replace my door. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a contract with him. He just came one day and he bought the stuff and he handed me a receipt for the what it cost and he billed me and I Venmoed him him the day he finished. I didn't have a hundred twenty day terms with him, yeah. a contract that I and I tried to push it out. You know, like it's it's just interesting that whether it should actually be more ironclad in a B two B relationship, it often is less. So yeah. it's interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in a in a past in a past role that I was in, past company, you know, I work for a software company, so we def, we definitely don't we don't have many supply chain issues ourselves, but our customers yeah. do. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just talking about like being good to being a good human, being good to work with. One of the things that we were facilitating was like collaboration between manufacturers that were having similar issues. You know, so like it's almost like the supply chain issues were like a great leveler. And, uh, you know, every, you know, competition is always there, but people are all of a sudden like consoling amongst themselves to say, Hey, how are you dealing with this? Who are you using? And that, that kind of like network effect of being a good human, being somebody that's easy to work with created opportunities for people like partnerships or just other avenues for getting what you need, you know? So I think that part of it's really important too. Yeah. You get to put out. Yeah. If you, if you're, if you put out good, positive energy, you, you get out of it, whatever you put into it, you know? Yeah, so absolutely. If, if you put that out and you are genuinely, you know, a, a good person with good intentions and you want to collaborate and help other people, that's going to come back to you. Yeah, and absolutely. the opposite is also true. So. Yeah, well, is. I have I have a horror story that I'm going to share with you guys. So a lot of people know from my my past, I've been in operations before. So I was working in the warehouse and there was a product that used to come through our warehouse called chat. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but it's kind of a herb and it gets flown from Somalia into the UK and then into Canada. Well, it's legal in the UK, but it's not legal in Canada. 
and it only has a shelf life of 48 hours. And they used to wrap it with black plastic, but you could tell if it was going bad because the boxes. It, sounds, it already sounds bad. Like, yeah, I was sounds... like where, where is this going? <laughs> well, kind of... hold on. <laughs> so the boxes, you could Importing totally Importing illegal products. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your mule, you had a problem with your mule network. <laughs> So the paperwork, yeah. you could always tell by the paperwork, you could always tell by the boxes. So Canada Customs came in one day and they were like, we're going to set up a sting operation and you are the one that are going to give the documents to the people so that they go to Canada Customs because they actually get a fake stamp when they go to Canada Customs and they come back to us for release. You were a narc. Right. Yeah, so, a, he's a narc. So everybody Are you wearing a wire to... right now? Is that's my question <laughs> yeah, for you. But <laughs> so everybody in the company decided this was a good idea, but me. And I ended up having to do it anyway. So they set up this sting operation. So they were all over the building. These people came in, gave them the documents. They went to Canada Customs. They came back and they stopped them in the parking lot. And they did a takedown at the back of our building and these people had knives on them, which was the scariest part. And then a couple of months later, they come in and they're like, we need you to um, come to court and we need you to testify <laughs> against these people. And I was like, absolutely not. not. <laughs> what? No. no way. I was like, absolutely not. But they said, no, you have to. So about a week before the trial, and this is like, I had so much anxiety around this. And I was like, I don't really want to do this. Like you guys put me in this position. So a week before the trial, I get a phone call. Um, we can't find the people and they won't be able to make it to court. So you don't have to come in and testify. And I was like, thank you so much. Somebody's looking out for me. That was, that was a sliding doors moment. There was no, so there was no I, alternate version of this. There's no let's talk supply chain. Just, so the yeah. so the other day on my show, hey, let's talk I, parole. Yeah. So so the other day on my show on Friday when Romel mentioned uh, Frank Lucas from about Blue Magic, I freaked, but I think you just trumped that. <laughs> well, okay, you need to tell oh, the story American now because not right? everybody yeah. heard it. Oh God! So on Friday I had the lovely guest Romel Watley of Truck and Hustle Podcast. Um, it's a podcast that really focuses on getting diverse suppliers visibility into the supply chain and logistics network for, you know, getting us business and visibility. So anyway, I introduced him and interviewed him and along came during the interview. He said, um, you have to be a, become a practitioner of your craft. And he was like, as, as long as you know your craft, you're very knowledgeable. Nobody can tell you anything. He says, good dope sells itself. You know, like, <laughs> like Lucas... <laughs> I said, oh, whoa, we ain't talking about that on no bullshit. <laughs> We're not selling no dope. He was like, you know, I'm talking about blue magic. I know exactly what you're talking about, but we're not talking about it on this show. <laughs> you guys gonna shut me down. <laughs> we ain't talking about no dope over here. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I get it. So, so my horror story is actually something um, that is also very fresh for me that I will, uh, what do you, what is the proper phrase, like not name names to protect the innocent or, yeah. you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a, it's a customer. So I mentioned we support software vendors. So when I started in GA, I very much so thought that I was going to be like working with all these customers that are like, yes, I have no idea what I'm doing. I admit it. I need your help. But instead, it's been all the software vendors calling us like our customer has no idea what they're doing. <laughs> and we don't have time to help them figure it out and also configure software. So like we need you to come play therapist, change management, trainer, PM, whatever. <laughs> so we can configure. <laughs> so we can get mediator <laughs> so that we can configure software. So, so um we we start this engagement and the software vendor i mean like very very nice nice team um but way in over their head customer very large no implementation framework in place so it's this it's september they were supposed to go live in june mm -hmm. and and i was like oh so you know what's like what's what happened well they keep adding on more requirements well how are you managing scope creep Oh, well, we're just building it and hoping that no one notices that we actually haven't built this other stuff 
and we're just letting like, but you're not getting paid in the meantime. So, you know, they're given a take. Um, well, needless to say, a couple of days ago this week, they are closed effective immediately, this customer. <laughs> so no. No, there will no, be no, no. no live. There will be no alignment of requirements gathering and nothing else. It's just over. That is, a, that is a that's sad story. yeah that is scary i think that's an entrepreneur's worst nightmare i think so i think for me like dc hope and i <laughs> that's like our worst nightmare it i is. think for you guys too jed and eric but you also sure. work for corporations so you know it's a little bit different but for us damn that is not good <laughs> yep so I found it a little bit scary, speaking of horror stories, that they asked the person who couldn't figure out to see all the people on the Zoom call, call on her phone to help out with software uh, implementation. <laughs> I've, I've already said that. We don't have to <laughs> revisit <laughs> that moment, Judd. <laughs> to, be, to be fair, I also, was it earlier this year or last? No, it was last year. I was doing something on Teams and um, I was talking to a very green, very junior resource, you know, like a year out of college. And I'm like, oh, Teams is so stupid. I can't do whatever feature it was. And she was like, yeah, you can. You just touch this, like, just do that. And I was like, oh, am I at that? Am I at that point of career? Like, am I at this that? remote point? is not working. <laughs> yeah, gotta bang it on exactly. the desk. Okay, wait, times. wait, wait. I have a story with Teams the other day too. I was on a board call and they put up a poll, and the poll did not come up on my screen. And they were like, Joe, just go into the chat bar. There's a link there. I'm like. I don't even have a chat function. <laughs> so I'm telling you, Teams has a yeah. few things that, and Teams I think does. they do it on purpose to, to drive you crazy. It's and then to be honest everybody. with you on the Zoom thing yeah. on the phone, I actually didn't figure that out until like a month ago. And I've yeah. been on Zoom for a very, very long time. So it's okay. I don't use it either. I, I've been schooled <laughs> recently. I've been schooled recently on my use of emojis by my team uh, and how <laughs> I'm unaware of the alternative definition of some emojis. So. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, you know, and I just didn't know it. And I was like, well, thank thankfully somebody told me this because, you know. <laughs> that sounds like a horror story. I was, story. I was thinking one thing and hard. I've been saying another. I don't know if I want, I don't know if I want a teen explaining what the alternative thing of emoji is to me. That would be <laughs> I know, that's how I felt. I was <laughs> like, I didn't know any better, you know? And so they're all kind of laughing at me. And I was like, okay, the old man, you know, it's like, oh I got more gray God. hairs that So day. don't feel bad, Judd, because my kids often chastise me for the over usage of emoji. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Too old to be, yeah, I get that all the time. Really? All right, Eric, you talk to a lot of companies. Do you have any horror stories that you can share? Because I know you have a lot. You know, I was trying to think of this for me. Like, I thought of this question narcissistically, not like, <laughs> as I cover. Um, and I thought, okay, I've been covering logistics for 20 years but i i've only ever had one shipment and that's when i moved abroad and when i came back like my own household stuff mm -hmm. other than that i don't have any horror stories in supply chain because i get to sleep at night and not have to worry about the actual freight either oh, my freight so or someone i know it must be it is nice sorry hope um <laughs> but from my from my job the horror story is always, and this is not one single horror story, it's multiple horror stories, is also when you are made aware that you've done something, you've gotten something completely wrong and something significant in your story. As a reporter, that is like, the, your heart just like goes all the way to your feet. And you're just a lot like, of puckering going on there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of it, it's like the, it's the textbook example of where you... <laughs> The textbook, <laughs> textbook example of wow uh the textbook example of uh of like how you how you react to it though you know like if you own up to it and you fix it uh you know it goes some way but yeah there's nothing worse than reading the email in the morning and go Can you, you got tell this, us the example you got this completely wrong. well i haven't made a mistake in so long that it's hard to remember any actually oh, really oh, oh, narcissistic there <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding i can't think of any actually i was trying to think of one before the show it, you know they they tend to happen more when you're young and you rush and you're overconfident and you um think you know more than you do and now i'm very well aware of all the things that i don't know what i do so i never write things that i'm unclear about 
Mm -hmm. um but it okay. happens a lot like in the tw my 20s and early 30s it happened a, a, like a lot especially as i was learning what shipping was and learning what supply chain was and and it's so weird like the way journalism works because you get paid at, at the beginning you get paid so little the way journalism works is they put people in roles that they're not equipped to handle straight away right. and they're supposed to be authorities on very complicated subjects writing and in my case writing to an industry that knew this stuff like the back of their hand and i'm right and i'm supposed to write and so it was like you know obviously they're gonna call me out and be like the hell are you talking about this is not right you know so but now I'm, I'm like if i make that mistake now shame on me now it's like little things like i got someone's name wrong or you know i'll tell you the other day i not to get too political or anything but the uh there was a guy i quoted and i accidentally put his last name as someone who worked in the trump administration and it, instead of his actual real name and he called me out on it and he's like i don't work i didn't i never worked for trump this is my name <laughs> so that you know those are it's like little stupid stuff like that it's not anything major anymore that's Hopefully. awesome knocking on wood knocking on wood well i don't know if you guys saw this on the news a few i think it was like a week or a couple of weeks ago by the time this airs it's going to be about a month or so ago but there was a spillage of sex toys on i-40 no oklahoma. In oklahoma. i love it oklahoma yeah. right what it was in Oklahoma, right? It, yeah, it was near Mustang on the outskirts of Perfect Oklahoma state. City. So I got an email. <clears throat> Hi. In your package to is a, delayed. You what? <laughs> no, I said your package is delayed. <laughs> yeah, right? No, I got an email. Hi. In response to the massive sex toy spillage on I-40 this morning, near Mustang on the outskirts of Oklahoma City, Cam Soda, an adult company, is providing immediate relief to those affected by the loss of inventory. Already en route to the citizens of Oklahoma, Cam Soda has dispatched several trucks full of dildos and lube to replace what was lost in this devastating incident. <laughs> I don't, first of all, I don't understand how they got my email. Second of all, I think that they wanted me to put this out as a story somewhere i mean i guess they're getting what they wanted because i'm putting it on this episode but he's getting what they want apparently but it was definitely a horror story because of the the product that was out there on the highway and then for this company to actually come out and say our hearts go out to all those affected by the accident we understand these stressful times and these supplies are what help people take a load off <laughs> Someone I mean, had too much fun. Someone had too much fun with that press release. Perfect. I just want to say for the record, that is not a joc.com story. And never mind. no, definitely not. But talk about a horror story of like an accident of these kind of products being thrown all over the highway and somebody taking advantage of it and sending an email out to a whole bunch of people. Just I just thought it was really funny, anyways. I'm such so I, I saw a, a big um a big trailer turned over on the side of the road. And I wonder how many people think with the way I think. So when I passed, I was like, oh, I wonder what's in there. Like someone's gonna be missing their inventory. Like yeah. how many orders are gonna be backed up because right? of that? <laughs> like other people are probably like, oh, that, that truck's on fire. You know, that yeah. that's probably yeah. very unsafe. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. Like is customer service reaching out to these people? Like are they gonna get Notifications well, there, of their order. There's, there's a factory that's going to have some downtime. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we need to get kind of back on track with our Halloween kind of special that this is. So I want to ask you what superpower or maybe Halloween costume would you want to wear to work every day? Hope? Is Lord. I, I, I contemplate this. About this. Yeah, I thought about it deeply. And the only thing that kept coming back to me is two. I'm either going to be Bruce Wayne oh. or I'm going to be Bruce Leroy. I need to know both of these. Bruce Why? Leroy is from The Last Dragon and he is the master of everything, but he had to go through some stuff to get there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, and then Bruce Wayne is, uh, of course, in character to uh for business so i'm just very business there's no 
hanky panky with me. Sorry, I didn't have a really good childhood. I <laughs> 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 don't know fun characters. I'm sorry. <laughs> Eric? Well, I mean, I think the natural thing for me is like Clark Kent, you know, Superman just because of the germ, you know. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't also, uh, Spider Man, I think, didn't Peter Parker also work for, uh, yeah, he's a photographer, yeah, he's a photographer for, you know, some sort of, some sort of, yeah, but really, I mean, come on, I'm, yeah, I'm probably gonna end up being, uh, Dumbledore for Halloween this year. (laughs) Dumbledore. Because my son is obsessed with Harry Potter right now. So okay, we all gotta we all gotta fall in line. Can you do me a favor and send us a picture? We'll do a follow up of this episode. I will. I will. At this point, my beard is so white that it just it you know I got that covered. (laughs) But well, Eric, I have to say I think we're learning a lot about you today, and I appreciate you, DC. Um, I would definitely, okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to go what I would definitely be and then follow along with Eric um, and what I'll probably be. <laughs> I would definitely be Wonder Woman. Um, I mean, like, okay. number one, like, that is a badass, like, costume. <laughs> Absolutely. And every day, like, yes. Um, like, full armor, not, like, regular clothes. Um, yeah. And because I am... After, so we talked about, you know, Sarah Dubai, how long I was there. Like, I think that that solidified for me, or maybe it was like any lingering inkling I had of like imposter syndrome. What am I doing here? Like, has my company been tremendously successful because it was a fluke? Is it beginner's luck? And like people who are nice to me or people who know me, like they have to be nice to me, kind of like they have to support me. Like my (laughs) friends, my family, like people that I talk to regularly. Um, But like random people in Dubai that have never seen me before don't have to be nice to me. (laughs) So, so many people say like, oh my goodness, like, thank you for your knowledge. You're so smart. Like, what can we do? Thank you for coming all this way. I was like, damn really am badass with like my three-year-old on my hip and <laughs> like trying to Good. run my business from the other side of the world. So I would definitely be Wonder Woman. Like I am a totally do it, like walking into that role and like taking it all on. Um, I will Forget probably- that. I think, I think you're system architect woman. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Forget, just create your own uh, Marvel character. Yes, definitely. And I will probably be Owlet from PJ Masks, though, because okay. my, my kid is Gecko. Um, my husband is Catboy, and I am Owlet. There, there are three <laughs> who uh, go into the night to save the day before bedtime. So. And, they're, and they're done that. <laughs> I, love that. I love that. Thank you, John. Um, you know, I uh, was thinking about this, you know, for the last, I don't know how many years, a long time, my, my annual Halloween costume is Elvis. I have like, uh, I have, I don't know, four Elvis suits. <laughs> I, I do that. all different. And so I, I like different why. ages, like D- Vegas different. Elvis, young Elvis. Totally. Yeah. 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 Like, blue, like Hawaii Elvis. All that. That's right. It's usually yeah. just the jumpsuit. Awesome. Like I've got awesome. a couple of them and uh, a couple of yeah, I, I was just going to say, do you do like the whole performance? I'll do it. I don't know how good it is, but uh, I, I, but something about when you put on the Elvis suit and you, the glasses and you can kind of hide behind all that, man, it feels, you feel powerful. So I think as a marketing person, I'd be Elvis because, you know, I can be the front man. I'll put on a show. If I have to entertain you, I will. If I have to distract you, I will. So, and uh, I'm pretty good at the uh, fake judo kicks and uh, all the posturing. So I'm going to go with Elvis. <laughs> I love that. I think we need to see that on here. Too. Oh, I almost, I almost swore it. I swear. It's, I, I know right where it's over here in the closet. I, it's, just, it's on the ready at all times. We probably should have dressed up for this episode. We should we have. Should, we should. Yeah. No, that, that was an LTSC fail. Oh well, that's okay. I would say for me, I'd be Harry Potter because he like goes into things and solves the problems because supply chain professionals are all problem solvers, and I love Harry Potter. So thanks. So that's me. Although I've never dressed up as Harry Potter. I'm usually a cowboy because it's the easiest, or cowgirl because it's the easiest thing to do because I just need a cowboy hat. True. Cowboy hat and boots? Yeah. Or the boots. Yeah, the boots. I got jeans, so it's just the boots and the cowboy hat. 
My my wife is going as uh, Bellatrix, so she's got the whole wig and everything. That is okay. We you know, definitely. Little, it's a little scary how much she actually looks like Bellatrix. <laughs> We actually need a picture of this, Eric. Yes. We'll so um, I had actually sent you guys um, a resource because at the end of last year, Supply Chain Digital rounded up their 10 worst supply chain disasters in history. Did you guys take a look at these at all? Because it's really weird that a lot of them happened in the 1990s. Yeah. Notice that. Any idea why? Like, what was it about the 1990s? Was that the dot com? I was only I was, I was gonna I was just thinking like is that before the like the world is gonna end in you know 2000 and <laughs> yes 1999 that's very true yeah I was only seven years old I'm gonna bow out of this one gracefully <laughs> Damn. Yeah. To, be, to be to be fair I to be was fair. very young <laughs> but I was gonna I'm like channeling my history book like recent history but when I was in high school like we did talk about the 90s and the 80s I can't remember anything about the 1990s but cross colors <laughs> I remember hey Arnold so which uh, which of these stories really stood out for you guys I think for me the Hershey story um really stood out for me because it's a Halloween episode and um, they were talking about how they spent more than a hundred million on transforming its IT infrastructure and supply chain in 1999. And they were expected to go live in April, but the schedule slipped. And rather than wait till the following year, Hershey switched over in the summer, but the system was dogged down with issues, not least of which was that inventory was not visible to the order management system. And as a result, $150 million in orders were missing and their quarterly uh, profit dropped by 19%. Now, one of the reasons why I bring that one up is because they're actually going through something similar this year, but it's not because of their IT infrastructure. It's because their factories have been down because of the pandemic. And they had to decide between whether they were going to produce regular candy bars or Halloween candy bars because they actually use the same line to be able to produce both. And so they decided to produce their regular candy bars instead of their Halloween candy bars. And so we will see less Hershey Halloween candy on the shelves this year. Oh, definitely seen that. Definitely have not seen an impact in this store just yet. Um, see, but I, I did notice about two weeks ago, we're seeing a lot of fruity candy versus chocolates. So maybe that is what that is. Like nerds and trolleys and stuff like that. Or people are going to be just doling out full-size chocolate candy bars instead of the little minis. Yeah, or maybe they just dole out that truck that first truck that Sarah said flipped over in Oklahoma. <laughs> oh. oh. Then, then I'm not taking my kid out for Halloween trick-or-treating <laughs> this year. It's been, a, it's been a rough week, sorry. <laughs> no, but seriously, it, with infl inflation, you actually think people are going to go buy regular candy bars for Halloween? I don't know about that. No. I don't know. I well, keep I hearing was, about I sales. I was thinking from, like, as a millennial parent and just knowing what I know about millennial parents in the area, people are like, you know, give my kid uh, the Auntie Annie's organic, whatever. Like, yeah. I don't even know anyone who's giving their kids Hershey candies anymore. So, you know, I, I try to look at things from like, I am not the market perspective. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> friends are not the entire market, but I'm also like, are people still giving their kids Hershey's? Like, there are so many, like, better for you brands that are around now. This is, this is my son's leftover candy from last Halloween, just so you from, know. So oh, you want to see, exactly. see what he's left behind after 10 months? After 12 months, he's left behind a Crackle, Snickers, Twix, all the same stuff I had when I was a kid. Hershey, there you go, Hershey Dark special. Yeah. That's so, why he left it. My, so it's not going to really be missed. Snickers and chocolates that are in the in the refrigerator and he's eating like and, and oh, I don't I don't mind like everything in moderation but he opts for like the other 100% fruit like no sugar added like he opts for those wow. so you, you know up. you got it going on <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know Sarah I thought that you were gonna say you know this one was really like this story was really important or it stood out to me because 
it happened in the 90s, but we're in 2022 and people are still doing the same thing. Dream Let's man. just Very go true. live Keep with yourself. the system that we should not go live with. And oh crap, we don't like, and nothing works. Who to thunk? <laughs> Nobody knew. We didn't learn from Hershey or from everyone else who's done it for the last 30 years this way. We're just so, going to keep doing it that way. Maybe that's the supply chain horror story is that we really haven't learned anything, learned anything. <laughs> from 1999. <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> just, maybe, I, maybe I should go there for my client's payments. <laughs> <laughs> we need a time, a time machine. machine. Yes, right. <laughs> Eric, you owe me a beer, buddy. Okay. <laughs> I owe you a lot of beers. <laughs> Do you have any implementation horror stories, Jeff? Um, you that know, we haven't learned from, I don't, I don't know any implement. No, I don't know any off the top of my head, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I don't even have one I can make up, but, uh, no, I, I, I don't, I think every, I think every company, you know, the, the probably the, the biggest challenge with every implementation is when they're looking to find some kind of software solution, they need to get it done now because they're usually in crisis mode. So, you know, I think every implementation is a horror story in and of itself, because, you know, there's already some pent up need. Nobody ever does it ahead of time when they're thinking, in the future, we really want to make things run smoothly. They usually do it because something's broken. Something's broken. Yeah. Do they ask you to speed it up because they need to hit Always. the timeline? Always. And, and Who doesn't want like, everything no done one. already? That's Can I right. just pay you more money? You just put more people on it? And it's like, sometimes no. yes, but also sometimes no. It's not <laughs> like, the answer sometimes. It just really it isn't. Works. Yeah, exactly. It's just not the answer, you know? Because sometimes things are... And any, every implementation is different. So they ha all have their own kind of like criteria. And so some are just complex, you know, they just take a while, you know, some take just longer because of business rules or whatever it may be. So I don't know. I think everybody feels some kind of horror story pain when they, when they want to implement new software. Absolutely. I've only ever worked with one company <clears throat> who said we need to implement software now because we're introducing a new sales channel and we know that we're not going to be able to keep up with inventory and mm. plan demand and capacity etc in our spreadsheets so let's do this now and get ahead of it and i was yeah. like oh that's so very smart of you wow. <laughs> yeah mo most yes. companies have already planned on revenue coming from that new sales channel and they're behind by two months and they got to get it done and it's going to be your fault as a vendor and all that other stuff that goes along with that. Yeah. So Let's Eric, see. I know you're leaving us soon. And so before you leave, because this is our Let's Talk Supply Chain 300th episode, um, before you go, I want to make sure that I thank you. I'm going to thank everybody else later before we go. But I wanted to ask you, what has joining the Let's Talk Supply Chain family meant to you? And uh, what do you envision for Log Tech Live moving forward? Uh, so much more work to two days every month than I had before. That's no, I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> uh, it's been amazing, honestly. Like I, so I mean, we've talked about this before that I I'd always wanted to do some type of show, whether it be a podcast or a live show, and it was always felt so daunting to get it off the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And the most amazing thing that you do is you just like make it like where you just, you do what you do best and everything else is kind of handled. Like you mm -hmm. tap into your network, you meaning me, I tap into my network. I bring people I know are going to be interesting to hear from. And, and then you give the megaphone to, you know, to broadcast that out to this awesome network. So, I mean, just, and, and just knowing you and all the people that you work with, it was like a no brainer for me to, to want to be involved in it. It's, it's like, completely surpassed expectations from that perspective so i love it it helps me think things through in an entirely different way than writing and interviewing mm -hmm. and it um keeps me sharp in terms of talking in between when we do events and most of all it's just super fun i get tons of great feedback about it and i get to like talk with people in a way that they open up in a way that i don't think i normally do in other formats so um awesome just I love like that. zero, zero negative things to say, honestly. I love that. What do, what and I would say if there was one. Oh, I know. So. What can people expect <laughs> from Log Tech? What was what? Uh, expect. A uh, new name. A new name. We need a new, new I name. I know. I know. No, I can't change the name now. <laughs> uh, just, you know, I try to, 
have a good mix of all the little areas that I touch, meaning domestic transportation, international transportation, trade compliance, little uh, economics thrown in that's not too deep because then I, you know, go crazy. And then uh, just super interesting founders. Like that's what I focus on. Like I have so many cool conversations with founders. So I just wanted like people to hear from these people directly because there's just so many awesome stories to tell. So. So many more to come. And then one qu last question before you go, what's your favorite Halloween candy? Favorite Halloween candy is, oh, Skittles probably. That's the one I always end up stealing from my son. Man, the amount of like things that I'm learning about you today, Eric, is <laughs> that I didn't know before. <laughs> is, that a, is that a window into my personality in some way? Yeah, I don't you, know. Exactly, you're saying that. It's like, I didn't peg you as a Skittles guy. No, <laughs> yeah. right? I pegged you as a like a starburst. Like what? What is the difference? <laughs> How are you pegged from a candy point of view? <laughs> yeah, I should have asked you. What do you think my favorite one is? That's right. Before That's I answered, right. <laughs> I don't actually know what I would peg you at. But Skittles was not the answer. I was excited. I had him at I had him at Twizzlers. <laughs> oh, I hate <laughs> Twizzlers. I'm a red. I'm red vines. Red vines all the way. Licorice then. Yeah, but. I that luckily I don't go to movies anymore so I never get those so <laughs> all right well thank you Eric for joining us on the show today I know so, you gotta get going so I appreciate so that. great to join you all bye Eric bye Eric all right happy Halloween everyone <laughs> all <laughs> right so let's continue this conversation I want to know what all of you guys what your favorite candy is DC Halloween candy um, I'm, I'm going to go with like the first thing that came to mind because that's probably, you know, he's like, first, first thing, that, first word, what, what comes to mind? It was Snickers. So like, if I think about it, I feel like that's not my favorite, but if <laughs> it is like, if, if that's, if someone says, what's your favorite candy? And the first thing that comes to mind is Snickers. And like, that must be my favorite. But if I think about it, I'm like, no, there's something I like better. But if I can't think of anything, then there's not <laughs> anything I like better. And Snickers is my favorite. So Eric <laughs> has some um, squared away from last year. So you can always send yeah. him a message and yeah. he'll probably send you some of it. Some of the, yeah, I've got my kids yellow. Snickers from, um, <laughs> they because you know since my, my kid is a permanent fixture um he is he is now part of my brand <laughs> he is he is because i saw him as a part of your uh, headshot so that's <laughs> he um he he was able he managed to um get an entire bucket of candy at edge and um since he does not like any of it <laughs> because he's 100% fruit kind of kind right. of candy kid. All of the Snickers, the Twix, the Kit Kats, like all of that is is mine. So I have one like nice. twice a day. You know? nice, nice. What about you, Hope? <laughs> Trolley gummies. What is that? I've heard you say that before. Yeah. I'm <laughs> in Canada, okay? So Okay, trolleys are trolleys are these little neon bright gummy worms. Yeah. They're they're sour um and they have I like, a, like those though yeah trolley gummies yeah uh, i like those so you're gonna the other bring one, some of those for our trip huh i sure will sure will and the other is ferrero rocher Ooh, fancy oh no. nice. you me <laughs> yes champagne tastes darling champagne <laughs> <laughs> judd <laughs> um you know i'm not uh, much of a sweet tooth but i like uh swedish fish yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Those yeah. are good. Like Swedish. Those berries. are good. Those oh, are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine is not necessarily something that you might know, but they're sunflower butter, dark chocolate, like peanut butter cups, but not with peanut butter. It's with sunflower butter. Sunflower butter. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Do you want me to bring some so you can try? Sure. Some? Yeah. All right. All right. Is that really a thing? Sunflower butter? It is, it is really a thing, Hope. There yeah. used to be sunflower butter and uh, was it like this little, not cracker, but like kind of like a little pita bread Delta okay. used to serve on the plane. I don't know those. Um, Pre-pandemic sunflower That butter. sounds delicious. I, I, I do not agree with Sarah that it is so good. Yeah. But. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's champagne taste, I think. <laughs> 
right. So now before we get to some of the questions that I talked to Eric about, we probably should talk about crisis management because out of these horror stories, I think one of the common themes is crisis management and how do we, it's all in how we react to situations, right? And how we get out of them and what that looks like. So we've talked about a few horror stories today. We've talked about them in a variety of different ways, right? Um, Some we've had personally, some are financial, some are, you know, products actually being spilled across highways. Um, But like the, like I said, the common theme is around crisis management. So what would each one of you maybe say some advice or action items, DC, I'm taking that away from your, your title. Um, when they, when somebody in supply chain is faced with a horror story like this, how, what advice would you give them as far as their reaction or how to think through the problem or how to come up with a solution? Because at the end of the day, we're all problem solvers. We all want to come up with some sort of solution and get out of this horror story. Sometimes there is not that option, but most of the time there is, right? So what advice would you give somebody? DC? I think that if you're if if you are a seasoned professional, you know, kind of a veteran in in supply chain, then this is probably not, you know, a piece of advice you're like, duh. But for, you know, newly minted supply chain professionals, like it happens, you know, don't don't let it keep you up at night. Mm-hmm. We work in a world where things will go not according to plan. I don't want to say go wrong, but you have a plan, you expect the day to go one way in our world of supply chain, logistics, procurement, manufacturing, like it's just plan on it not going the way that you expected it to go Mm -hmm. and don't let it emotionally rock you. You know, have a clear mind, don't panic, take a walk, drink a glass of water, come back, you know, try to solve the problem, but you are not alone. Misery Mm -hmm. loves company. Like you could probably pick up the phone and talk to every single other person that works in supply chain. And if they're not dealing with the same problem, it's a similar problem or causing a similar amount of pain. So I think that it's a lot of just managing your emotions and not letting it get to you and just trying to problem solve with a clear head. And I I, I hate to say get ahead of it or get in front of it, but from just like, like if you don't have this at your company, on your team, in your department, whatever it is, like contingency plans. And the contingency plan itself might not always be the plan that you are executing on, but the fact that you are just regularly talking about what if something happens, what do you do? Everyone gets in the mindset of problem solving. So that when a problem happens, it's not like, oh my goodness, like, what do we do? Like everyone is used to the exercise of, okay, this happened. What do we do? This happened. What step, you know, the next step, as opposed to everyone just be like, ah, running around there, you know, heads on fire. It's, it's something that you should have like continuously be doing and just instill culturally. It's everybody's job to contingency plan and risk manage within your role and within what you do for the rest of the company. I think that's really great advice. I also want to mention that we've got a really great community online, like on Twitter. And I think on LinkedIn, if you tag the right people, I think that they'd be more than willing to um, help you with some advice if you are in a situation or you do have a problem or things like that. And I think that's sometimes overlooked, right? I think like you said, DC, we kind of feel like we're on an island and we're all by ourselves, but we don't have to be, right? You can really reach out to a lot of people and social media gives us that platform. Judd? Yeah, you know, I I appreciate, you know, some of the guidance that, that you just gave. And um, I think, you know, from a, from a marketing person's point of view, um, you know, depending on what side, depending on what company you work for, you're either going to be sending a message to the market, your customers, your shareholders, and and I think that having a having a plan or or having credibility and speaking the truth and 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 feeling as though like you're presenting that you have a handle on the situation, what you're saying is forthright, like you know you do have a contingency plan or you're giving next steps. And you don't sound clueless. You don't sound, you know, like hair on fire. I think all of that projecting confidence and and trust into in whoever your audience is, I think is really it's really important because your crisis is going to be somebody else's crisis. Could be a retailer's crisis. Could be a customer's pri- crisis. Whatever it is, 
And people are looking for you to not only get the information, but almost crisis management for them. And, and, and I think like, you know, you've got to just project that you're on the, you're on the path, you do have a plan and like people can trust what's coming out of your mouth. I think it's, I think it's really important because you mentioned like everybody in a company has to ha be part of the contingency plan. Everybody in the company who may or may not say something or whatever you do from a company standpoint, you're projecting the brand and uh, you know, you have to protect that in a way and you have to be approachable and trustworthy. I think all that stuff is just paramount to me. That's great advice. And I think also know when to apologize. So some of the yeah, examples yeah. that was in that resource, that supply chain digital article, which we are going to reference when we do release this episode. Um, I think the Walker's example, they took out an ad and I think the, the title of it was humble pie. Yeah. Right. And they were, they were apologizing for uh, their missteps and their misfalls and things like that. And I think it's, I think it's okay to own it. Right. I think <laughs> to be vulnerable and say, yeah, you know what? We made a mistake, but this is how we're going to rectify it. Hope. So I'm kind of going to pull from all three of you all there. Um, definitely want to not respond with your personal emotions for business. That's probably the biggest thing that business owners or founders make is that we respond personally before we look at the business as a whole. So definitely checking those emotions like DC uh, suggested there. Um, secondly, having that plan in place and making sure that all parties that would be a part of that crisis are aware, um, understanding that um, people understand if there's a claim process, a loss process, what's the steps to get that claim handled for your company. Um, and then lastly, um, being empathetic to the crisis, mm -hmm. understanding that things are not always your fault. Um, there's with supply chain, we have several different steps above us and several different steps behind us um, that we're not in control of what happens before it actually gets to us. So being empathetic and open to what other people's circumstances are that could possibly create that crisis. I think that will help us with managing it once it gets on our plate. Um, but I've been empathetic enough for 12 months of payments. <laughs> <laughs> That's a limit. There I need my money. A limit. Yeah. And there's definitely a limit for small business as well. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate all of you guys. Now, like I said, when Eric was leaving, it is the 300th episode. And I just want to thank you all for, you know, being part of this episode, being a part of the Let's Talk Supply Chain family, producing, you know, series of impactful live content really felt like a huge goal when I originally started thinking about it. And you've all done an incredible job of making those ideas really a reality, right? Our live content is one of the things I'm the most proud of. And when I started Let's Talk Supply Chain, it was really about, like, I only used myself because I was the only person that would work for free in the beginning. <laughs> but it was really much, very much a goal of bringing the community to the community and um, providing a platform for others, the best and the brightest in the industry to really have that platform to be able to create content and bring value to each other, right? And you guys are a really big part of that. And you've really helped us launch that. And we've got big plans. We've got lots more coming. We've got a brand new live show that should probably be launching a little bit after this episode um, and uh, so much more to come. So I just want to say that I appreciate all of you guys for that. But what the same questions that I asked for Eric, you know, what has joining the Let's Talk Supply Chain family kind of meant to you guys? And, you know, what do you have in store for your shows? Hope, do you want to start us off? Sure. So uh, joining the Let's Talk Supply Chain family for me definitely has opened uh, my mind to growth uh, in the media world. Um, I was kind of refined to my IG lives that do so well. <laughs> so it, though. <laughs> in my mind, you know, um, but Let's Talk Supply Chain has definitely provided me a platform for growth and visibility into markets that I never see myself being in so I'm very appreciative of Let's Talk um, to Let's Talk Supply Chain for that um moving forward with no bullshipping with Hope White I'm hoping to take that to a syndicated possibly national platform um and hopefully trying to get some of those C-suite executives in play um for the show so we can get nice. we can drill down where my eight month payments are <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna plug it all the way yeah like, we are not going to we Do are not it. going to forget that you are <laughs> high-receivable. Judd, thank you, yeah. Hope. Thank you, Hope. Yeah. Judd? Sure. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, first of all, I just want to say um, it's been a pleasure to meet both you, Dicey and Hope, you know, and I think, uh, you know, that's one of the things that's been really nice about being involved with Let's Talk Supply Chain is just expanding community, you know, meeting people like yourselves, hearing your stories, and also seeing like, just personally seeing how you're using the medium and how it's impacting your business and what you do and whatever your plans are personal or, or professional. So I, I love that aspect of it because it's a lot of like what we're trying to achieve from a company standpoint is just grow the community, like to, to reach out to people, to learn from people, hopefully educate other people. You know, we're a software company, so I'm not doing this really to get leads and sell things in a way, but what, what I'm really trying to do is just connect, connect with people in the market and hopefully share some stories. So um, that's, that's why we're into it. I think, uh, you know, as far as like what we can expect from um, special delivery, I, I, I want to bring in more customers. Like, <clears throat> you know, I'm the only one that likes to hear myself talk all day. You can ask anybody <laughs> on my team, but like <laughs> what I really want to do is get other people in. So, you know, people can hear from each other's people can hear from their peers. That's really what people want. <laughs> they want to hear how other people are dealing with maybe similar problems or, you know, took advantage of, of different opportunities. And so if we can bring more of that to the community, then I think that'll be a real success. Awesome. I love it. Yeah. So many good things to come. DC last, but absolutely not least. Um, so I, I mean, like per personally and professionally, I've gotten two different things from let's talk supply chain. So I don't know if I've ever told you this, Sarah, but when I like, let's talk supply chain and women in supply chain specifically like that series, that is what gave me the motivation to like, keep going in an Ooh. industry where like I was the youngest only all the time in the room, almost all the time, only woman, like in the, in the tech space, in the supply chain space, almost all the time, the only person of color, almost all the time, the only woman. And I, I definitely thought like, you have those moments of, is this the right place for me? And I didn't know, I, I fell into supply chain. I didn't know anyone that worked in supply chain. And my points of reference were like middle-aged white guys. So when I think about who am I going to be in 10 years or 15 years, I'm like, well, I'm not going to be that guy. So who, I, like, you know, what does my career look like? Who am I going to be? And uh, let's talk supply chain is where I found like, oh, this is what I can do. This is, you know, the different roles and this is what it could, could potentially look like for me as a woman in the space. Um, so just personally like that, let's talk supply chain is the reason why I was like, yes, I'm going to continue to pursue a career in supply oh. chain. Um, so like, mm, play the, play, play your that's great. No, that was great. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, but I mean, pro professionally, just, you know, as like the company and, you know, et cetera, Sarah, you and I very similar to Eric, I had the idea of presenting a different voice and different type of content. Um, and I wanted to do a podcast and I was like, oh, I'm not going to do a podcast. Like when <laughs> I, I'm not going to sit and do all of that myself. Like it's just not possible. Okay. So, you know, being a part of the Let's Talk Supply Chain, you know, show family has been a great way for me to publicly rant and rave <laughs> and, and be very opinionated <laughs> about all of the ridiculousness <laughs> that I that I see in supply chain. Um, and I, you know, also very similar to Judd, I, I do the show for reach reputation and education. I think that there is just so much that supply chain professionals deal with. And mm -hmm. it's not a realistic expectation to for people to do their day jobs, spend time with their family, and then keep up with every single thing that supply chain touches. You can't be a financial, you know, expert. You can't be a logistics expert and a planning expert and a manufacturing expert. Like, there, it's just too much. Um, so I've used, uh, you know, action items as my little corner of, you know, the world to try to educate people as much as possible of all things, uh, you know, supply chain, cloud-based technology, like software implementation related. Um, so I'm, I, I don't know where action items is going to go next year. <laughs> honestly, I, I, I want it to be not more of the same. So, um, 
people, I, I, I was surprised that thousands of people watched my show. I know we, you know, we talked about like viewers, Sarah, I was like, oh, people, people want to listen to me. Yes. <laughs> um, talk, talk, talk about this stuff. So, so I really want to just go back and analyze and see like, what do people want to see more of? Um, is it more of the thought leadership and the experts that are seeing a lot of everything? Is it more of, you know, like Jet mentioned, is it customers? Um, is it more of, I've, I've been trying as much as possible to talk to practitioners who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily, I think I see, I see a lot of like, chief supply chain officer, SVP, like blah, blah, like fancy, fancy title. And it's like, yeah, but what's the demand planner doing? You know right. what I mean? Like, yeah. How is that person doing their job? How are they using this new tool that was implemented? How did yeah. things change? You know, how can I talk to the production planner? Yeah. Um, so, so I've been trying to talk to more of those people um the the problem ends up being is that they're like oh I you know maybe this person is better to talk to yes <laughs> maybe this person knows more than I do um mm -hmm. let me or, or maybe I should do the show with this other person because if I just said the truth I'm not confident in my knowledge enough to be a guest by myself right. so I want to bring on someone else so I really want to you know probably find a way to amplify what I would call the voice of the end user, like mm -hmm. the people were implementing these tools and you're, I, I'm not the person who's choosing what is going to be implemented. I'm not the person that is choosing the project team. I'm the person that has to actually sit right. with the software vendor and explain what the process is and like yeah. use the tool. So this is what my life is like. And this is why you should listen to what I have to say when you're picking tools and doing yeah. it. On the and so yeah. I think maybe well, and I think imposter syndrome is real. I mean, even with the blended pledge, you know, where we're giving away grants to diverse voices so they can say yes to speaking engagements. <clears throat> a lot of the time conference organizers are like, well, we ask this person and then they tell us to go and ask somebody else because they don't think they're the right person. But we need to see more diversity, not just on industry stages, but also in the live shows that we do in the guest seats. And it's not just diversity from gender and race and all that. It's also diversity from seniority, right? People want to be in the audience and they want to resonate with who's on the screen. And they don't always resonate with C-suite. And so I think that you're on the completely right track. And DC, I know you had trouble with Zoom earlier, but let me tell you, as somebody who does audio all the time, I have been recording on the wrong mic this whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> so it happens. <laughs> it happens. And I just wanted to let you know, because I'm going to own up to my horror story of this particular episode. <laughs> Anyways, on that note, I just want to thank all of you guys for joining me. I think that was a lot of fun. We had a lot of great stories from a, a you know, a variety of different things that are happening in supply chain or have happened in supply chain. We hope everybody has a great Halloween. And uh, I think we could probably talk for hours. So we might need to think about doing a holiday show or something like that. But anyways, thank you all for joining me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Bye. Happy Halloween.